Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. We will be back at our normal location next week, so plan on coming down to St. Luke's for that. Um, let's go ahead and stand to our feet as we prepare to worship God this morning. I want to read from 1 Chronicles 16. It says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Amen. So let us do that this morning as we worship him. Lord, we give this time to you. We ask that you would inhabit our time. We don't want to just meet together today. We want to meet with you today. And so, God, would you come, have your way in our midst. Would you receive our praise, our worship, and mostly receive our hearts as we open up to your leading and guiding today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
thank him for that freedom that we have in him. He has loosed all the fetters and chains and all those things that would hold us back. And we are free to worship him in spirit and truth. Shall we pray? Father God, we indeed rejoice in the freedom that is ours in you. And for that, we give you praise and honor and glory. We thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to worship you in. Your heavens declare your majesty. Your fields and forests declare your, your, your generosity. And God, the oceans declare your vastness. Lord God, we lift up your name today. You have reached out in love towards us. And Lord, we respond in kind. We reach out to you, God, because you, you have not only made us, you've not only created us, but you've also redeemed us from an eternity without you. God, thank you for that salvation that is ours through your son, Jesus, who so willingly put himself on that cross. A decision that we really have a hard time thinking through, but we are grateful indeed. Father God, we thank you for this venue, Lord, that you have provided for us to worship you in. And Lord, may your name be glorified everywhere we go and even out from this place. And people will be touched by the Spirit and see that they have need of a savior. Lord God, as our pastor comes today, would you not only avoid, uh, anoint him, but his voice and anoint his strength today as he brings your message to us. May our ears and our hearts listen intently. May we receive your word today, and may it prove to be manna for us in our spiritual growth. And through all these things, we pray expecting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As you know, we've been studying credible Christianity, and we are going to continue talking about this for some time. And get used to 1 Corinthians 12. Put a little bookmark in there because we are going to be here. I have a feeling for probably all of next month, okay? Um, as we're going into March now. Because there's so much in this that I think God has for us. I think that there's no coincidence that we're actually discussing this as we are now just beginning to get back together publicly and beginning a lot of our ministries that had to be put on hold for a while. So I think the timing of this, that we would happen to be here, that God had a little bit of a hand in that. How many know that nothing happens by chance? Right. You know, and I think this is one of those things. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to talk today about the first half of this chapter, verses 1 through 11. We're going to go into verses 12 to the end of the chapter next week. And these two weeks are going to give us kind of a, a groundwork. And then what we're going to be doing is getting more in depth into the spiritual gifts and talking about those. And what does that mean for the church today? But let's start, as I said, at verse number one. And it says there, now concerning spiritual gift, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. 
And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Let's pray. God, as we dive into this incredible chapter that, Lord, wasn't just written for the church in Corinth, not just written for the first century church, but is written even for those of us that name your name today. We ask that you would open our minds, open our hearts to receive from you and to learn from you what it means to be empowered by you and gifted by you. And so be in our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I want to first start by taking a look there at verses 1 through 3. Because I think it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know, sometimes I wonder if I might have a little ADD myself. Because sometimes I can get caught up on something. And this was one of those things. It starts off saying, concerning spiritual gift, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Then I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed or says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts. Now, I don't know about you, but all the times I've read that verse, I kind of just tend to skip over verses 2 and 3. Because for me, it seems weird that verses 2 and 3 are in there. Does it seem a little weird to anybody else? Because he starts off saying, now, which implies what? We are shifting gears. As we know, as we've been studying 1 Corinthians and this aspect of living a credible Christian life, Paul has spent a lot of time talking about their carnality, talking about a lot of the ways that they tended to live in the flesh, all the things that they were kind of doing wrong. But now he's starting to shift gears as he begins to talk about not carnal things, but more spiritual things. So when he says now, he wants him to say, okay, we're going to shift gears, and it's about what? Now, concerning spiritual gifts. And then the next two verses say absolutely nothing about spiritual gifts. In fact, what it seems to talk about is some really basics about Christianity. So he starts off saying, now concerning gifts, oh, but by the way, let me first mention something. And then in verse 4, goes to say, now there are varieties of gifts. And he begins to talk about it. There's a reason for it all. And there's a reason for these two verses, or these three verses right here. He says, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to understand something very crucial. And then he talks about the most crucial of all things. That if we are ever going to operate in the spirit, it starts by operating and living our lives rooted in Jesus Christ. We cannot possibly begin to live a spirit-filled life unless we first allow Jesus to come in and transform our hearts. And by transforming our hearts, putting the Holy Spirit within us, and then as we grow deeper, he can then begin to work through, work through us. Right? So if you think of yourself as being a tree, because when we're talking about spiritual gifts, we're talking about living a life that is fruitful, correct? And so if we're going to be fruitful, much like a fruit tree, what has to happen first? The roots better get firmly established. Mm -hmm. So they're getting all the nutrients that they need to get. And so this is what he's starting to mention here. I want you to understand some things about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant on this. It starts with Jesus. You know when you were pagans, you were led astray, you, you found yourselves worshiping some other things. And how many know an idol doesn't have to be made out of gold? That's right. An idol doesn't have to be a statue 
or a monument. An idol can be anything in our lives that takes precedence over God. And that can be an ideology, that can be a hobby, it can be anything. So it's learning to live our lives the way that he wants us to live them, first and firmly grounded in him. Not being led astray to mute idols, making sure we have one God and one God only. And then he says, I want you to understand, no one speaking in the spirit ever says Jesus is accursed. Right? They will never, ever speak against Christ. If somebody claims to be spirit-filled, but they do not accept the fact that Jesus died for sins and that he is the only way to get to God, they might, be, they might have a spirit at work, but it's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit is at work, what will happen through everything that we do and everything we say is the proclamation that Jesus is Lord rings through it all. The evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence and activity in one's life is not in the gift that we exercise, but it's in a clear confession and a firm commitment to Jesus. Because when we have everything rooted there, everything we do will point to his glory. Everything that we do will be to advance his kingdom. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to crown and exalt Jesus Christ as Lord. We always point to Jesus. So with that being said, in verse 4, he begins to lay out about spiritual gifts. He says there's varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Okay? Now, the word that we see here for gifts, you guys are going to, I may not have been good in English, but I'm especially not really all that good in Greek, but hallelujah, there are some great study tools out there that help you look like you're good in Greek. This word for gifts, for spiritual gifts he's talking about, can actually be defined as diversities. It's understanding there's a uniqueness of each Christian in the work that God has called him or her to do. But notice that even though there's diversity in that, it comes how? By the same spirit. There is unity. Does that sound a little familiar to you? There's going to be unity in what happens. So it doesn't matter what the gift is. There's a level of unity that is lived out as we each live out our own individual unique giftings. Now, this word in the original Greek is the word charismata. It's a word we get charismatic from. And it's... Interesting because there's two words in the first half of this. The word charismata comes from a root word, charis, which means grace. So what we see laid out here in this passage, because there's actually three passages throughout the New Testament that talk about different spiritual gifts. When we read through 1 Corinthians 12, these are known as the grace gifts. Because the word charis means grace. And what is grace? It's got, you know, the acrostic to it is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's realizing that the gifts that we have are not something we have to earn. They are something that he gives out of the fullness of just his character and how much he loves us. So he will pour out these gifts, these grace gifts upon us. But the word charis, grace, starts with C-H-A-R. And no, it's not char. <laughs> but the word in the original Greek means joy. So if you really break this down, it's operating in gifts that are given to you by the grace that God bestows on you so that you may, one, experience joy and give joy to others. When we are truly operating in the gifts that God has bestowed upon us, what happens is, is the more we do it, you don't burn out, you actually energize. The more you use the things God gives you, the more strength it seems that you have to be able to use those things. Now, I'm not saying there's not times you can still burn out on it if you're not careful. You have to take care of yourself. But generally speaking, when we operate in the gifts that God gives us, and we are taking some time for self-nurturing, you know, to make sure that our lighthouse, light bulb in our lighthouse doesn't burn out, what will happen is we will find that the ministry that we discharge actually 
that all that energy gets replaced within us. It's an unending source. It's a spring of living water, we could almost say. Mm -hmm. Spiritual gifts, these grace gifts, are our ability that enable us to glorify God. God gives them freely, and God gives them graciously, and he doesn't wait for you to get your act straightened out before he gives them to you. Don't believe me? You need to go back and watch all these other sermons that we've talked about over the last few months. The Corinthian church did not have it together. They were a very worldly church. They did a lot of things wrong. You continue to hear him talk about sexual immorality and all this kind of stuff, but they still seem to be fluent in the gifts, which brings up a very important point. I, I don't know about you, but I've been in some churches where you see the gifts operating very fluently, and sometimes there can almost be a sense of piety that people can have. Look at me, look how spiritual I am because of the gift I'm using. Read 1 Corinthians 12. This church didn't have it together. The fact that you're operating the gifts does not, is not a measure of how spiritual you are. It's just your willingness to be used of God. That's it. Holiness is a totally different matter. <laughs> And we will be talking about that more, I'm sure, over these next weeks to come. But God gives these gifts freely, and he gives them graciously. Your life as a Christ follower has been graced with a special ability, a divine enablement to serve the Almighty God. To be able to be used the way that he wants to use you. Now, this special ability might be hard for others to realize as a special spiritual gift. What determines if it's a spiritual gift versus a natural talent? Are people coming to Jesus? Is the kingdom somehow advancing through what you're bringing? Are people growing in the faith? Are they getting encouraged in the faith? If they are, it is now a spiritual gift. But your natural talents are simply lived out in your own natural ability. Spiritual gifts are lived out in the Spirit's ability to work through you. It's allowing him to breathe life into the natural. And sometimes it comes, you know, it's a very supernatural thing. Sometimes people, when they come to know Christ and they open themselves up to the being filled with the Holy Spirit, he will bestow gifts on them that all of a sudden just seem to appear out of the blue. There's other times that what he does is he takes a natural gift, but he puts the... Um, nitroglycerin behind it, okay? Or the turbo boost, anyone familiar with the old Knight Rider shows, right? He does something that brings it to a whole new level. What God has assigned for you to do is to help and build up the church, to build up the kingdom of God, to help it grow and to help it become healthy the way that he wants it to. And how do you determine its healthiness? Can it reproduce? Is it getting reproduced in the lives of other people? Is it being reproduced in the area of other ministries even? Understand this. We all have a spiritual gift. Some of us might not know exactly what that is. We hope to help you get there over the course of these next number of weeks. Begin to discover what that is for you. But understand this. You did not get the gift that you have because you're special or his favorite. It was a gift of grace so that God could build up the church. So use your gift for the glory of God. For us not to use our gifts and to simply sit on our laurels is to actually be disobedient to what it is God's entrusted us with. And I don't know about you, I wanna be obedient to his call, amen? Looking at verse 5, he, he lays out first that God has de designed different ministries to lead his church. He says this, there, in, in the previous passage, he mentioned what? That there are various gifts, but the same spirit. Here he says, in verse 5, there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And so that service is carrying a couple of different things. Number one, it's how are you using your gift? In, in what venue are you utilizing the gift? And understand this, as we've mentioned before, what do we also know about the word service? It's also used in scripture for the word what? 
worship. Right? The gifts that have been given to you are given to you as in for you to be able to express worship to a whole new level to God. Worship is a lot more than just singing the songs. It's how we live our lives. Amen. There are varieties of service. The way you live out those gifts, the ministries you, you discharge, the way that you choose to worship him through your body will vary. But understand this, it's still the same Lord. The first area, various gifts, same spirit, right? The spirit is who empowers us to do the gifts. But here he's saying there's varied varieties of service, but what? The same Lord. Who would that be? Jesus, right? Who's the spirit? The Holy Spirit, okay? So the Holy Spirit plays a role. Understand that he's the one who gives us the gifts. However, the way that we live that out is going to require us to be dependent upon another who rules over us to lead us and guide us in how we are to discharge that gift. Because that's what a Lord is, is it not? That's right. He's not a president, he's not a senator, and he doesn't belong in the House of Representatives. <laughs> Though actually, he needs to be there, if you know what I mean. We are talking about kingdom dynamics. Lords govern an area, but what they says goes. If they want to throw a party and they want your sheep for the main course, guess what? You don't argue with the Lord. No. He says, I want sheep. You, your response is, how many? And we'll get them to you. Right? There's a sense of obedience, a sense of submission that comes. So it's understanding the Holy Spirit gives you gifts, but we've got to take those gifts and make them submissive to what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do, not what we want to do for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay? True. And do you understand the difference? It's important, and so let me reiterate that. It's important that we understand we are to do what the Holy Spirit leads us to do, not what we want to do for the Holy Spirit. Lots of Christians out there simply wanting God's stamp of approval on everything that they do. And that is not what he's in the business of doing. He has some specific things he wants us to do. Now, there are some areas where he might give you a gift, and there might be a variety of ways to live that out. He may say, I don't care, you pick. But you better make sure you submit yourself to him first. And make sure, first, is there a specific way you want me to use this? What we need to do, what God's looking for us to do, is to participate with what it is he's already doing. And you know, when we take his gift and we plug, plug it in there, is it going to bear forth fruit? Is it going to bear forth much fruit? You bet. If it's fueled only by you, it might have some fruit, but I guarantee you it will be nothing lasting. Make sure you're moving in accordance with Christ. God wants us to serve one another because in serving others, we are serving God. And that's serving those in the church. It's also serving those outside the church and realizing, God, you gave me a gift. Now, how do I use that to reach both of those groups? He gave us the opportunity to serve just to lead his church consciously and alive into this understanding that Christ and Christ alone is worthy to be praised. Now, in verse 6, he goes on to say that God provides power in different activities to make his church strong. He put it this way, there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. So within those ministries, within those areas of service, there are specific things that need to happen. When we look at the Greek again in this area about the different kinds of working, the Greek word is, and, and I know I'm batching these words, but it's energimata. It's where we get the word energy from. It's the power that is underneath what it is that we do. And it's the spirit who brings that power. Amen? When we serve, we serve God with energy. We serve God with power. We don't serve him half-heartedly. We don't serve him in a way that says, well, I hope he'll use me. If it's something God wants to use you in and you've prayed about it and you know that that's what God's gifted you with and given me a heart for, do it. Don't let the enemy begin to feed your head with this aspect of, well, it might, it might succeed, it might not. You know, you tried this before and it failed. Anyone ever hear that voice in their head before? 
Because he'll be quick to try to cripple you right where you are at. If you know that it's what God has called you to do, you step out of it and you do it and get your ideas of what success looks like out of your head. And I say that with love. Because the things that we hear playing in our head is usually what society and what our culture has proclaimed as being fruitful. That somehow it's, it's either attached to one of two things, numbers or money. And what God calls you to is never measured by those things. It's always measured by eternal significance. So let us make sure that that is what things are, what we're allowing to judge our fruitfulness. But if we're serving where God wants us to, it will benefit his kingdom. And we need to never second guess it. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29, Paul says this when he engages in the building up of the body. He says, to this end I labor, struggling with all of Christ's energy, which so powerfully works in me. Striving and struggling with all of Christ's energy. So is it going to take work? Yeah. But you know what I find is when you discharge the work God gives, you give him just a little bit, he somehow or another picks you up and runs with you. He somehow, as you put your arm in motion, he gives the thrust to the arm to give it even more power. When we serve God, let us use the power he provided for us in order to make his church strong and his church mighty and to advance his kingdom. So what's the purpose? What is the purpose of the gifts? Verse 7 is... There's, it's a very short verse, but there's a lot happening there. In verse 7, this one verse, Paul actually declares three very important truths. Number one, every believer, say every. 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 Say that includes me. Every. every believer is given some gift. It says he gives to each one. There's no one that is overlooked. Your job is just to figure out what that is. Maybe it's praying for people. Then do it with all the energy you've got. The church needs more people praying. Amen? Amen. Maybe it's serving in a specific way. Maybe, maybe you look and you begin to say, well, I don't see ways where God can use this gift. You know, or I don't see a ministry where I can really plug this concept in. You know what? Talk to us. You know, we've had people do that in the past. Let us know what God's putting on your heart, and we'll see what we can do to come underneath and serve you to see God accomplish what he wants to through you. But everyone is given some gift. The second thing we see is they are given by the Spirit. You don't need to whip it up. You don't need to envy what somebody else has or covet what somebody else has. You've been given something. It's been given to you by God because God deemed you worthy to do that thing. And so provide it to him. And then the third thing is they are given for the good of all. Or some translations say for the common good. Problem is the Corinthians were using their gifts to honor themselves, to puff themselves up, to look really important instead of getting the, all the glory to God where it belongs. Your gift is not to build you up, it's to build the church up. The Holy Spirit is the one who will build you up. In verses 8 through 10, Paul lists for us nine very specific gifts. And this is not an exhaustive list, as I said. We're going to cover these a, a different day. And you actually find that he'll go in the next section and even highlight some other gifts. But each gift we need to understand here, because the main point he's making here is not about the gift. He's pointing to these gifts of, to make a deeper point that it is the one Holy Spirit that is doing it all. So therefore, and as we'll learn more as we talk about next week, that's why he says, I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Because we have all been empowered by the same spirit. Each gift has equal importance. It may not be equally visible, but it's equally important. In fact, we'll talk a little more about that next week, that even the ones that aren't visible 
are more crucial to the advancement of the kingdom. What I do up here on a Sunday morning, lots of people think of that as being one of the most important things you can do for ministry. And it's not true. Because you can take the pastor out from behind the pulpit and the church will remain. But you take the church out, there's a problem. Understand what you do is vitally important. And as we said before, even if it's just praying, be careful not to use that phrase, just praying. It's the most important thing you can ever do for the kingdom of God. Nothing else in the kingdom of God is ever going to happen if we don't first have people praying. If we don't have people seeking for God's kingdom to come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then everything else we do is to no avail. You are the powerhouse, those of you that are prayers. You are the powerhouse to what God is able to accomplish with, through his church. And I would much rather have only one ministry and 50 people praying than only have one person praying and have 50 different ministries. Amen. There you go. Do not let the enemy sell that short. Hospitality. Well, anybody can serve up coffee. Well, yeah, if that's your attitude, is that it's just serving up coffee. But do you ever stop to think that sometimes pouring a cup of coffee can actually be a spiritual gift? Because maybe in the pouring of that cup of coffee and you're handing it to somebody, maybe that person, you don't know, when they walked through that door that day, they probably felt like they were, had no importance. They probably felt like everybody had forgotten them, that their life is meaningless. And by you simply looking at them and handing them a cup of coffee with a smile saying, hey, enjoy it and we love you. That might be just what the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to that person that day. Everything that we do has power if it is given to Christ. Understand that if we are going to use our gifts, empowered by God, it's got to be for the common good. And he, the Holy Spirit, divides the gifts amongst us all for a very important reason, to unify us. Well, hold on, that doesn't make sense. He divides up the gifts to unify us. Absolutely. Because the truth is, if we didn't need each other, would we rely on each other? Probably not. But God wants to show his love through the unity that exists within the church. They will know you are my disciples. How? By, your love. By the love you have for one another. And how can you work together if you don't love one another? Mm -hmm. Right? But he gives us each gift so that we will have to rely on each other so that through the fullness of us all coming together, the world can see a church that truly loves and works together. And they see something real, something genuine, and they want a part of it. And it all, again, draws the glory back to him. The person filled with the Spirit will have a clear confession and a firm commitment to Jesus. He or she will put Christ in his rightful place, which is right at the forefront. They will discover their gift. They won't covet one another's gifts. They'll simply use whatever God's given them with honor, with joy, to glorify God and to grow his kingdom. But understand this. There's a responsibility. And I want to leave us with this bit of a checklist. And I'm going to go through these, through these kind of quick. Hopefully you can write these things down. I think you should write them down. If not, again, this can be found on Facebook later. It can also be found on YouTube. Because we, as we understand that we are gifted, we have to understand there's some dangers that come along with that. And some of the dangers we see in the church at Corinth. Number one, we can glorify the gift and not the giver. We can put too much emphasis on what it is that we do and think that everybody else should be operating in our gifting. And why don't they understand why my gift is more important than theirs? Why my, mine is number one? Well, your gift isn't number one. The giver is number one. And understand this, that because the real gift isn't the spiritual gifts, the real gift, if you read all the way down to the end of this section, chapter, in verse 11, the real gift is the Holy Spirit himself. Because it says he will work all these gifts in all men as he sees fit. 
There are primary gifts you're going to operate in, but just because today, you know, healings might not be something you're operating in, don't think it's not something God can still do through you. Don't think that you don't limit God by what you think your greatest spiritual gift is. He can operate any of them. Glorify the giver, not the gift. The second danger is we can require everyone else to possess the same gift that we have. And we just kind of hit on that. On the flip side of that, we can covet another person's gift. Man, I wish I had the gift of music. Instead, all I get to do is clean toilets, you know? <laughs> You know what? If if the church didn't have clean toilets, how many people do you think would how many visitors do you think would come back the second week? It's very important. <laughs> do you think that maybe the reason why some people cover other people's gifts is because they don't understand what theirs is? And I think that's very, very true. It's it can be that. It can also just be that they don't see theirs as being important. We tend to hierarchialize. That's my new word. Word, for, word of the day, hierarchialize. Don't ask me how you spell that, but it's, it's I like it. Um, maybe I'm speaking in tongues right now, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yes, absolutely, we tend to, or, or we would just wish we had it, you know? Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking for ways. We're, we're looking for, we know God's put something within us that wants to be used of him, that wants to be important to him. And so we can sometimes begin to covet. And, and that's just listening to the whispers of the enemy. You know, we all get it. We, we all have had that happen to us, self-included. You know? But that's why I say, be careful. Just seek God out. And whatever you know he's given you, just use it for his glory. Until he points you in another direction. But we're hoping to help you guys discover that over these next number of weeks. What your specific giftings are. Another thing, danger is we can become a spiritual show-off. We become so good and God is working so wonderfully through us that we begin to forget that he was the power. Yeah. And we begin to almost go on autopilot. And then it becomes, and the problem is, is that you don't realize you're on autopilot at first. It's kind of like the snowball rolling down the hill. It doesn't realize nobody's pushing it anymore until it hits level ground and it begins to slow. And it's the same thing lots of times with us as Christians. We forget that God's the power that set us in motion. We forget that he's the power behind what we do. And, and over time, we begin to learn some things in the natural, and then we begin to operate in that natural understanding. We forget the supernatural power that is required to do it, okay? So be careful of becoming a spiritual show off. We can also, as we talked about before, wear it as a badge of spirituality. Do not think yourself as more spiritual because God is using you. He is just being gracious. <laughs> the only reason I'm up here is because of his grace. It's not because of anything I can do. The danger, another danger, gifts can bring disorder. Right? Make sure you're using your gifts according to God's orderly fashion. Chapter 14 will talk more about that. Number eight, we can deny our gift. We can just outright refuse to accept that we even have one. Or we can neglect our gift. We know we've got it, but we're just waiting on God in prayer until he shows us the very specifics. Step out and do something. The old adage, you can't steer a parked car. Get moving for Jesus and then let him direct you in the way he wants you to go with it. So what's our responsibility? Quickly, discover your gift and understand it's a mandate from God himself. It is not a suggestion. It is a commandment for us to use our gifts for his glory. Develop your gift and your understanding of your gift. Paul gave this encouragement to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4, 14, he said, Do not neglect the gift that you received by the laying on of hands. Don't push it off to the side. Don't push it in the corner. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 6, he gave him this instruction. Fan into flame the gift that has been given you. Understand that even though it comes from the Holy Spirit, there's some aspect that we've got to fan it. We've got to blow on that fire to get it roaring. Once you've discovered your gift and you've developed your gift, deploy your gift. 
It was given to you to use, so use it. It's a tool, it's not a toy. Use whatever gifts you've been given soberly. Use them joyously, but use them understanding that this is a tool that God's entrusted to you. It's not something for us just to use flippantly as we desire. The rewards that you'll get, it'll bring you joy. Amen. Amen. I'll guarantee you, you will never experience more joy than when you let yourself be used by God where he has empowered you to be used. Secondly, it'll keep you active. And thirdly, it'll build up the church and make the church healthy. First Corinthians 12, 7. Remember we mentioned it's for the common good. Can I give you one more Greek word? It's the word symphoron. That's the word for common good. It's the word we get the word symphony from. It's all the instruments coming together with their unique sounds, with their unique abilities. Some written different keys, or some formulated in different keys. How many know that the, a piano is a C instrument? Here's your music lesson of the day. But you've got some instruments that are E flat instruments and some that are B flat instruments, which means to, for them to play in the same key, they're kind of playing in a different key, if that makes sense. We have to understand that God brings our diverse gifts that sometimes don't look alike, sometimes aren't even structured alike. But when you put them next to each other and you allow one conductor to direct, it's all gonna come out with beautiful music. Let's remember, it's not about the gift or the gifts, it's all about the giver. Amen. And what do I mean by that? The giver is who? Jesus. It's the Trinity. It's Father, it's Son, and it's Holy Spirit. It's not about the gift, it's about the giver. It's about a Heavenly Father who gave the spiritual gift of His Son to cleanse us of sin and give us eternal life. Did it cost Him something? Yes. But He served us in that way. It's also, the giver is a devoted Son, Jesus Christ, who modeled the life of servanthood supernaturally given for others and who gave us the Holy Spirit as our guide and our power. And the giver is the Holy Spirit who gives revelation through the word of God and who empowers every believer through the spiritual gifts. As I said before, you could say that the Holy Spirit is the spiritual gift. We just have to figure out how he's expressing it, how he's expressing himself in and through us. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are at work in us, that you are wanting to work through us. That Even though sometimes, God, it seems like you could do a much better job without us, you still choose to use us because you want that relationship. And so, Lord, we open ourselves up to be used of you. God, I pray for each and every person here within the sound of my voice, Lord, that you would begin to show them and reveal to them new truths as far as what it is you have gifted them with and how it is, Lord, you would like them to move, that, move forth in that. God, I pray that you would give them all boldness and a hunger to a new level that would thrust them into using their gifts for you. The Lord God, you would continue to encourage them, that you would continue to speak to them. Understand that you are the power. It's not about what we can do. It's not about our ability. It's about our availability. So use us, God. We're just making ourselves open, just instruments to be played by you. So would you play us, Lord, the way you desire? In Jesus' name, amen.